Thank you, Dr. Roark, and thank you all for being here. Um, just to sort of, because since you mentioned the podcast, and I'm actually going to be doing an interview. Um, if you're interested in the North Korean human rights issue, I'm going to interview uh, Judge Kirby, who did the UN Commission on Inquiries report. Uh, supposed to interview him later this month. Hopefully, it'll be up maybe early March. So if you're interested in that, please uh, give it a look. Um, but to start off on our presentation, unification bonanza or continued division. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the division of the Korean Peninsula. Needless to say, uh, there's been very little progress on unification. Um, but this title comes from something that President Park Geun-hye said recently, which it, or last year. At the moment, I'm aware that there are some people who think unification is unnecessary, especially in light of the costs and financial burdens. However, I believe that unification is a bonanza. It will allow the Korean economy to take a fresh leap forward and inject great vitality and energy. Now, the question you might ask yourself is, you know, this year was the 20, or the end of last year was the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's been almost 25 years since Germany was reunified. Um, we've seen in the interim the unification of Yemen, uh, which was another divided state. So the only remaining divisions are China and Korea. So why, other than the approach of the seventh anniversary, might Park Geun-hye take and bring up the issue of unification? And why would she call it a bonanza specifically? It seems sort of like a strange type of term. Um, sometimes this is translated as a jackpot, which makes you think maybe this is sort of almost a gamble. So part of the reason why is basically over time, people have become less and less interested in unification. Um, you still have people in their 60s, 70s, those who lived through the war who are still alive, who have family members who they hope to see, who are very much interested in unification. But as you move down the age cohorts, things start to become less meaningful for people. And so there's a couple things I want to put up here. And first, a little warning about polling. Um, when I was at Asan, uh, I had the fortune, because they were very generous, to do some polling work in South Korea. And working with one of my colleagues there, one of the things that he pointed out, which often we feel we understand, but we don't necessarily, is that how you phrase a question is very important in how you're going to get a response. And that often, even when you feel you're trying to take and simply give someone the proper information they need to answer the question, you're leading them in a, unconsciously in a direction to get the answer that you may or may not want. So that's one reason why I put up these two different polls. SNU does a yearly poll, and I haven't seen the poll for all of last year, but essentially support for unification when Pak and Hay was considering this was at about 54% and only 40% for those between the ages of 19 and 29. Now, the Asan Institute asked a slightly different question. Rather than do you support unification, are you interested in unification? So naturally, it's much easier to be interested in something than to support it. And if you look at that, the numbers are much higher, 82%. And this is from a poll that came out very recently, but only 71.8% uh, for those in their 20s. Um, but if we get back to what Pak and Hay was looking at, what we'll find is, is that essentially, those in the 20s and the 40s, they view unification as an economic issue. It's not a question of, you know, the North Koreans are our brothers and we need to be together again. It is more of a question of will this or won't this benefit us as an economy. Now, if you also look at overall, the importance of ethnicity in terms of people's general perceptions of unification is also falling. But perhaps more importantly, when you get right down to it, if you look at those in their 20s and 30s, they're 20% less likely to take and support a tax increase to pay for unification. And it's below 50%. It's about 36 points something for those in their 20s and 38% for those in their 30s. So essentially, the younger you are, the less likely you are going to be willing to pay for unification. So I think this sort of points to why we're seeing Pak and Hay sort of phrase this in, you know, this is something that's going to be worthwhile. It's going to be beneficial economically. And there's another reason why this is important. Anybody who's even casually listened to anything about German unification will know. The first thing people talk about is that it costs a lot of money. It still costs Germany a lot. Now, there are some differing perspectives on that because much of the investment in East Germany was done uh, to build infrastructure and it was done to take and benefit what ultimately were West German companies. So there are some who believe it costs less because the money funneled back into the state. Uh, but ultimately, the one thing we do know is, is that unification will cost a significant amount of money. 
So this is why I think she's trying to take and focus on the economic side of it rather than simply, you know, this is our destiny. We are one people. We should be one country. So here's the real question. You know, can it be a bonanza? Last fall, Marcus Nolan of the Peterson Institute did a study on this. And for any of you who know of Marcus's work or have read any of his papers, you'll know, one, he's very thorough, very skeptical, and he's not one to exaggerate numbers. So when you ask what he found, basically what he found is, is that it would benefit both North and South Korea. And one of the key points that he points out is, is that unification will not take and slow growth or make growth a loss on, in the negative absolute sense in the South. Growth will slow in the South, but it will continue. So the South simply won't grow as fast. The North will grow much faster, um, and you'll see a quick drop in overall poverty in a united uh, Korea. But one of the other things I thought was interesting is he was asked when he did this paper to uh, address the issue of, will there be a peace of dividend? And in essence, what he found was is that um, if you look at it in 2013 dollars, um, there'll be about a $600 million peace dividend for South Korea. For the United States, it's questionable whether there would be one. Uh, but for North Korea or the northern half of the peninsula, once you take and you reallocate many of the resources that are being pumped into the military, um, essentially it would be worth perhaps up to 10% of North Korea's current GDP. So there'd be a significant benefit for the North in taking it moving towards unification. Now, one other option is essentially, you might have heard if you've studied uh, Korea any, this idea of gradual unification, of having a confederation before having a unitary state. And if you were to do that and create a customs union, there would be, in essence, no real impact on South Korea for the simple fact that all you're doing is you're allowing goods to travel back and forth. You're not allowing the factors of production like labor and capital to move back and forth. So it's less of an issue in that sense. But here's the, one of the other questions, too. And I put this on here because Korea has the lowest uh, birth rate in the world right now, uh, lower than Japan's. Um, it's aging. Japan is older than Korea, but Korea is aging more rapidly. Um, it's setting new records in terms of becoming the uh, super-aged society. Now, this year or next year, I think, the number of workers in Korea will actually drop um, and will continue to decline. So the question has been in South Korea, setting aside the issue of unification, how do we take and increase the workforce or stem the tide of population decline? There's a series of things South Korea can do, but one that people will bring up from time to time is unification. North Korea's population um, is believed to be uh, both younger and more fertile. It's believed that North Korea reproduces at about roughly replacement level. So if you were to take and unify the country, you would likely see a small dividend on the population side. But demographically speaking, if we look at, for example, the German experience, within five years you see that births quickly fell off. Um, in a more broad sense, as any country becomes wealthier, births tend to tail off. So while there may be a short-term benefit to unification in terms of demographics, in the long run, it likely will not address the uh, unified Korea's or South Korea's long-term demographic issues. So when we think about unification, after Puck and Hay made the quote that I put up earlier, she gave in Dresden what's referred to as the Dresden Address. And it laid out essentially a three-part agenda. One deals with the human dimension, one deals with prosperity, and one deals with laying the framework for unification ultimately. And if we go through roughly what this means is, one, start on the human level. So separated families, um, humanitarian aid, um, support for pregnant mothers and young children, these sort of basic types of steps. When we get into the co-prosperity agenda, we're looking at things like infrastructure, so building roads and rail, telecommunications, um, working on taking and improving farming in North Korea, um, taking and going into the extractive industries, mining by South Korean companies and joint projects of that type of nature. When we move into the agenda for integration, this is where you get a series of different things. You get one, for example, right now, 
North Korean culture and South Korean culture are becoming more and more different as we go on. So, you know, cultural exchange, uh, you're talking about mutual educational standards, different kinds of things that would lay the groundwork for the foundation of a unified society. Some of these would be much broader uh, based in terms of sending in South Korean economic management help, um, so things that would help on the economic side, but it's a mixture of cultural and economic issues and in the long run, taking and providing support for North Korea's entry into international financial institutions, so that way it can receive financial aid as well. So what sort of underlays all of this? And President Park, before she came to office, um, in a Foreign Affairs article, put out this idea of trust politique. And I won't necessarily go through and read the quote, because it's somewhat long. but. The broader idea is that right now you have a lack of trust between the two Koreas and that without rebuilding that trust, it will be impossible to take and solve the larger issues of denuclearization, of unification, you know, of any type of major issue that you're going to deal with between the two countries. And so this policy, though, is embedded within a broader context, which is the Asian paradox, which Park Geun-hye has also talked about which is this idea that the countries of Northeast Asia are becoming wealthier and wealthier, but at the same time, the security dimension is becoming more and more difficult. That rather than taking an economic solving your security issues, it's actually in some ways exacerbating them. So what are the elements of trust politique? Well, one, unshakable commitment to safeguarding sovereignty and national security. So no compromise on security issues with North Korea. Two, resolving the nuclear issue through deterrence and parallel pursuits of no negotiations. And then three, the normalization of North South <coughs> relations through a trust policy. So essentially what we're talking about is moving from smaller to bigger unification. Now, where does Pak and Hay want to start? Um, as I mentioned early on, you have divided families in Korea still. Many of them each year are dying off. Uh, the Park and Hay administration has been fairly consistent over the last two years of pushing for family reunions. We had one last year, uh, but there has not been one since. Um, but the idea is, is that you would start with family unification or family reunions. You would move to things such as cultural exchange. You would then take and have marry that with humanitarian aid. And then as trust built and progressed, You'd move on to larger economic projects, so perhaps the expansion of Kaesong. Um, you would move to things like the creation of another industrial zone, the reopening of Mount Kumgong. And the idea would be is that as you build trust, hopefully you can move further and further, and that this would then take and alleviate the problems. So what does that also include, though? Trust politique is not necessarily simply a north-south policy. It's also a policy that has aspects that are embedded within South Korea's regional policy and its broader global policy. And so if we look at South Korea, right now, Seoul is trying to do what sometimes is referred to as the Seoul process or the Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. And the idea is to take and use the same methods within Northeast Asia to build trust amongst the different parties. So China, Japan, South Korea, and Mongolia and the United States. So the idea is, once again, take start on manageable things like energy cooperation, places where you have mutual interest to try and build up trust and cooperation between the countries in the region. And over time, slowly move that into a broader policy to take and create regional stability. Now, more broadly, then it moves into what is called the Eurasian Initiative, which deals with things such as completing the rail lines through North Korea, connecting Europe to Asia all the way through Korea, and then building economically forward through that. So as you go through, essentially what trust politique is, is it is a series of policies aimed both bilaterally, regionally, and more broadly globally, designed to take and start from a very simple level, an area to where both sides can pull back if need be, and then move forward and to take and build on that with broader projects that would integrate both North Korea and South Korea, the region, and then more broadly integrate the region into the broader global economy. So if South Korea has a policy of 
trust politique and is trying to reach out. The question we next have to ask is, you know, what is North Korea's interest? You know, if we consider any type of engagement policy, you know, it's fine for me to say I would like to take and talk to you and build a relationship. But if you are unwilling, then my efforts will only go so far. So, how? What are North Korea's interest in improved relations? Well. Kim Jong-un has essentially followed what's been called the Byung-Jin Line policy, which is the idea that North Korea can pursue both its nuclear weapons policy and improve its economy at the same time. Um, the United States and our, our allies have essentially put forward a policy counter to that, which is that North Korea has the choice of either pursuing its nuclear weapons program or reforming its economy and joining the global economy, but that it cannot do both at the same time. Um, North Korea. Um, is essentially taking and trying to establish a series of things. One is regime security. Two is unconditional assistance. If you look back at North Korea's pattern of behavior, um, and you know this is sort of interesting, is that they tend to not want conditions attached to food aid or other things. Now, over time, we'll take and we'll get them to allow certain amounts of monitoring and other things. But they essentially want to take and be able to take and receive aid from us, but not have to take and have any conditions like other countries might have on it. Um, one of the big issues in talks with North Korea is essentially the sequencing issue. Right now, the Korean War technically still is in play. We have an armistice in place. We do not have a formal peace treaty. Um, North Korea has pushed forward the idea that before disarming and giving up its nuclear weapons, there has to be a peace treaty in place to ensure the security of the regime. North Korea is also looking for the removal of sanctions. There are a series of sanctions on the regime. They include everything from UN sanctions related to its missile and its nuclear programs to unilateral United States sanctions to the May 24th sanctions on from South Korea put in place after the sinking of the Chonun and the shelling of Yongpyeong-do. Um, North Korea also often talks about the end of a U.S. hostile policy. Um, if you've seen the news of the last few days and North Korea's announcement that it will no longer talk to the United States, you can kind of see some of this playing out, this idea that you know, the U.S. is taking and permanently trying to take and eliminate the regime and that that is our only real goal or end and that there is no real possibility for engagement. Um, some of the things that the end of a hostile U.S. policy might include would be the removal of U.S. troops from the peninsula, uh, the removal of the U.S. nuclear umbrella, and the end of military exercises. Um, the one we hear most often about is the end of the exercises. This has come up recently in both the North Korean proposal to South Korea for talks and the North Korean proposal to the United States for talks through the process, but also of taking and putting a pause on its nuclear program. Now, as a colleague of mine, Seth Haggard, pointed out recently, this is somewhat contradictory in that North Korea wants the U.S. and South Korea to end exercises both to take and put a pause on its nuclear program and for the right to talks. So not really one or the other, but in order to attain both, you have to do this one thing. So another question we have to ask is, you know, Kim Jong-un has been in power for a little over three years now. Has anything in North Korea really changed? In some ways, it has. Um, under the Byung-Jin line, there have been efforts to take and build up the North Korean economy. Depending on what source you look at, there are now between anywhere between 16 and 20 something special economic zones. Most of these are very small. Um, having talked to a colleague of mine who works uh, in North Korea and tries to provide them assistance on how to take and get these things up and running, um, he says there's probably only two or three that are really viable in the long run, maybe, in terms of the way they're being run. Uh, but one of the interesting things that has come out of this is that you are finally starting to see some delegation of power and control from the top to local actors. So the cities and the regions are able to take and influence some of these zones. So we are seeing some types of economic reform. Um, there have been efforts to take and reform the agricultural sector. Um, farmers are now allowed to keep about a third of their crops and there's talk that they may be able to keep more. 
So it's taking to help and boost yields, even though North Korea has less fertilizer than it did in the past, um, shows sort of the benefits of a market-based incentive system. Um, so there have been some changes, um, but we've also seen the nuclear test uh, in 2013. Um, North Korea finally put a satellite in orbit, uh, even if it didn't stay long. So they're developing and pushing forward their ICBM program. Um, so on the military side, one might say things haven't changed. In 2013, one of the things that came up at the time was everyone also said that, you know, North Korea is more unstable. It's more belligerent in its discussions. And it got me and two of my colleagues, uh, Andrew Kwan and Peter Taves, thinking. And so we went and we pulled through essentially all, we stuck to just KCNA's website. And we wanted to see, for example, for war and peace, you know, how have things changed? And you can see looking at, you know, 2012, you know, there's one point in March, which is when a lot of the provocations began, that, you know, there's this huge spike up to almost 450 mentions. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, peace is much lower. So you're seeing this increase in hostile language in terms of both using terms like war and using peace, at least relatively speaking, less often. Now, if you look at the ratios of change, once again, you can see, you know, there's this huge spike when you start comparing, for example, 2012 to 1998. Um, and if you, if you go to 2009, you know, you have a similar push. Then, you know, if you look at more, we'll say constructive terms like reconciliation and dialogue, you know, there is one spike, but for the most part, it's fairly consistent. Everything is sort of grouped in there together. And these aren't necessarily terms that regardless of what North Korea's, you know, policy at the time is, whether they're engaging or whether they're being provocative, that they really tend to push forward. And as you can see, you know, for the most part, other than that one spike, it doesn't ever get really above maybe 32 mentions a month. So not something, relatively speaking, when you're considering they're mentioning war up to 400 times a month, that they're really verbally expressing to the outside world that they're interested in. So where are we now in terms of relations? At the beginning, well, slightly before the beginning of the year, South Korea made an offer for talks. Um, we haven't seen that go anywhere. Uh, the North Koreans said that they would be willing to, under the right circumstances, take and hold a summit this year, uh, which is somewhat interesting given that we haven't been able to take and arrange even sort of basic level talks, but yet they want to jump all the way to a leader's summit this year. Uh, essentially, right now, we have, you know, the question of dialogue or confrontation. Last year, South Korea hosted the Asian Games at Incheon. And just before the games concluded, North Korea sent three individuals who were generally believed to be within the top of the leadership. Uh, Wang Pyong So, who went, uh, is generally believed to be the number two person in the regime. Uh, they had expressed a willingness to meet with South Korea. Um, one might even say that they essentially said, give us a time and a place and we will be there. Those talks have yet to happen. Um, the talks I mentioned from the New Year's statements have yet to happen. So then the question becomes, given the current environment, if we're unable to take and reach talks, and if the North is now pushing back against the US, are we likely to see, despite these efforts towards engagement, there to be either another nuclear or a missile test? Now, there were sort of low-scale missile tests last year. So the idea that missile tests will continue, I would say, is a strong one. A nuclear test most likely really depends on where they feel they are in the development cycle. In a broad sense, North Korea tends to test when they believe they are ready and need to, as opposed to around the circumstances. So I think a nuclear test is really going to be dependent on where they feel internally their program is at the moment. So what else is different now in terms of North Korea? Well, the environment within which the North is working is changing. Human rights has now become a much more important issue. Uh, we saw the Commission of Inquiry report come out last March. Um, you know, the report goes through it and in some ways graphic detail describes uh, 
know, political prison camps, forced abortions, rape, um, torture, pretty much any crime against humanity you can think of, largely the regime has been documented as having done. Um, the report put forward a series of recommendations, one of which was that the issue be referred to the Security Council and ultimately the International Criminal Court, and that potentially Kim Jong-un be prosecuted for these crimes. Uh, we have seen uh, the report be forwarded to the Security Council. It is likely to take and stay there. It is unlikely that China or Russia will allow it to move forward to the International Criminal Court. Uh, but the fact that it is now on the Security Council agenda, I think is an important step forward. But one of the other things that's changed is South Korea is now looking at its own North Korean Human Rights Act and what to do. And this is a significant step forward in that there had been a lot of sensitivity to this in the past in South Korea. Um, concerns that talking about human rights uh, in North Korea would only take and antagonize the regime and would inhibit the, its ability to take and try to deal with it on broader issues. Um, the policy of the Park and Hay government has largely been to deal with human rights issues through international fora. I don't think we'll see that necessarily change, but the fact that there's more of a discussion and it's more on the surface in South Korea that you know, these are real issues that need to be addressed, I think is important. But what else has changed? You know, um, we had the issue of the Sony hack. Now, there are still and there will likely always be questions about whether North Korea was actually behind the attack. Um, if you listen to any cybersecurity experts, they will tell you there are a lot of things that the US government has not put forward in its case that would indicate that it could have been any other group. Um, if you listen to administration statements and the way they phrase things, um, my perspective is, is that they're leaving open the possibility that even if North Korea itself did not actually do the hack, that it took and encouraged someone else to do it. Um, so that there is a tie and that ultimately it does go back to Pyongyang. Now, the more interesting evidence, which we probably won't for a long time get any comment on, is there was a, I think it was the Telegraph in the UK, if I remember, but it was a, or the BBC, one of the two, but that public, oh, excuse me, sorry, it was actually Germany, Der Spiegel, who published a classified US document that indicates that we have been in the North Korean computer system since 2010. Now, if that's the case, then we very much likely do know that it was North Korea if we were able to see inside their systems. Um, but either way, um, the administration seems very convinced that North Korea was ultimately responsible. Um, we've taken and placed in placed new sanctions on the regime. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe, North Korea is not the most sanctioned regime on the planet. Iran is more sanctioned. Um, there's some other countries that might be as well. Uh, but the interesting thing about the new sanctions are sort of twofold. One, the individuals who were targeted by the sanctions specifically fit the pattern of countries who we know North Korea either does missile or nuclear weapons business with, so places like Syria, Iran, um, or key economic partners like China. So in essence, we're saying we're going to go after your direct lines of money. Uh, but two, Treasury now has a more explicit authorization to go after third parties who are engaging in transactions with North Korea. So rather than the specific entities that were being targeted by the sanctions, is this ability to take and over time go after the third parties that might actually take and do a dent in North Korea's international transactions. Um, I think the comparison um, that you've seen in the press a lot with these sanctions being like the Bank of Delta Asia sanctions uh, back during the six party talks are somewhat off the mark. In that case, we went after one institution where we knew there was a significant amount of North Korean funds and we knew they were doing illegal transactions. We seized those funds. Um, in this case, there isn't necessarily a large pot of money anywhere we've gone after. And to be honest, it's much more difficult to go after North Korean finances today because in the aftermath of Bank of Delta Asia, North Korea has become much more um, diverse in how it moves its money around. It moves its money around in smaller increments. So finding a large stash is going to be much more difficult. But in light of that, North Korea is now under pressure on sort of multiple fronts. Well, how else has the regional dynamic changed? Since Kim Jong-un has come to power, we've seen him reach out to different actors. Uh, early in his regime, 
he reached out to Southeast Asia a lot, um, Singapore and some of the other countries. Um, Singapore and Malaysia are two of the countries who are thought to perhaps be involved in some of the new economic zones in North Korea. So you've got that. But more interestingly, there is often discussion that North Korea is too dependent upon China. And one of the challenges when you look at North Korean economic data is that all we have is mirror statistics. North Korea doesn't report data. We know very little factually about how large the economy is, how much trade they're doing. Um, and mirror statistics can sometimes be wrong. If you've seen the press, there is this great debate going on of whether China provided any fuel oil to North Korea at all last year. Um, in the commercial statistics, there's none. There's no trade in fuel oil. Um, the belief, though, is, is that China gave it in terms of economic aid and so therefore doesn't publicly classify it. But because of this thought that from what we do know, North Korea has become much more dependent upon, especially in light of the South Korean sanctions of China, there has been efforts to reach out to both Japan and Russia. The Japan part of this, I think, is somewhat interesting. Um, it is unlikely, I think, that they're going to be able to solve the abductees issue. Uh, but if they did, it would change the dynamics both from an economic front, potentially, and a diplomatic front in very interesting ways. Um, in the six-party talks, you know, one of the concerns with Japan was always that rather than denuclearization, the abductee issue was always number one for Japan. If you can take that off the table, it might help on the denuclearization side. Um, but it would definitely take and potentially give North Korea another economic outlet because Japan would remove some of its sanctions. And they already have removed a few, but it's not necessarily things that impact North Korea very much. Um, Russia, um, I wrote a piece um, to where basically I called them the new odd couple of Northeast Asia. So the two guys who are under international sanction and increasingly more isolated are now basically grouping together. But the Russians and the North Koreans have talked about not only military exercises and economic projects, but Kim Jong-un uh, may make his first international visit uh, at, for the VE Day celebrations in Russia. Um, it's unclear if it will actually be him because the Russians have only said the North Korean leader, and that could mean you know, the nominal head of state rather than Kim Jong-un. Uh, so we'll probably have to wait and see. But I think it's likely that he does attend. Uh, also interesting is we've seen relations between North Korea and China cool. Um, they have been trying to move to what they call state-to-state -state rather than party-to-party -party relations and to normalize the relationship. Um, I think it is somewhat telling that Xi Jinping has met with Park Geun-hye five times now and that he's explicitly visited Seoul before meeting with Kim Jong-un. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say necessarily that China's policies are changing, but they are clearly expressing their displeasure to North Korea and its current behavior. Um, and we've talked already about, you know, the offer to engage the United States in dialogue and sort of where that stands. Um, and Sung Kim has recently said that we did try to reach out to the North Koreans, uh, but we couldn't come to terms on logistical details, uh, primarily because the North Koreans wanted us to come to Pyongyang, which would raise the interesting question of, since they still have a quarantine for Ebola in place, whether Sung Kim would have had to have stayed in a private room for three weeks before he could even meet with anyone. So. What is really preventing them from sitting down at the table? Well, if you listen to the North Koreans, um, and the reason why specifically the offer from the Asian Games hasn't happened, well, one, um, activists in South Korea take and send balloons across the border. Sometimes they put money, sometimes they put propaganda. There's been talk about attaching the interview to some of these and floating it over. Um, but in essence, the North would like the South to stop the balloons from crossing the border. Uh, South Korea has taken the position that this is an expression of freedom of speech and that they have no legal way to stop them. Uh, the only way would be as if there was a specific reason that they might be in danger, such as if the North were actually going to shoot at them. So the North has shot at some of the balloons, so this could become a bigger issue. Um, you have the May 24th sanctions in place. Um, North Korea's response to the South on humanitarian issues is, if you really want to unite separated families, stop worrying about that and lift the May 24th sanctions. Um, they've obviously called for an end to the military exercises. And then, of course, the nuclear program and the missile programs are obstacles to dialogue. Specifically, the fact that the North doesn't actually want to engage on these issues. 
So are there other challenges to improved relations? Well, one of the problems when we were in the six-party talks was the verification issue. In essence, you can make a case that the North has agreed twice to denuclearize. Once with South Korea when they agreed to have a nuclear-free peninsula, and then in the six-party talks, uh, interestingly, this September will be the 10th anniversary of them agreeing to the denuclearization process in the six-party talks. Um, North Korean security concerns, um, they want assurances that what happened in Libya, Iraq, and other countries won't happen to them. The northern limit line, um, at the end of the Korean War, uh, we essentially took and placed a series of islands on the South Korean side and drew a line in the West Sea and said that you know everything south of it was South Korean and the north of it was the north. Uh, the north has never formally acknowledged that territorial line and it often becomes a sticking point and this is where you sometimes see the exchange of fire between the two. Um, the inability to manage low-level cooperation. Um, you know, if we look at some of the projects that have gone on, be they things like the family reunions, uh, be they simple economic exchanges, everything constantly runs into a problem, either for political reasons or other reasons. You know, there's just an inability to really sort of get something going and keep it going and to not interrupt it. So, you know, they have difficulty managing low-level cooperation. You know, another challenge is, and this came up in a project I was working on about a year ago, is that to a large extent, many of the countries in the region are comfortable with the status quo. We've talked about the concerns of the costs and the difficulties of unification. So the South isn't necessarily keen for changes. Um, if you look at this from the North's perspective, um, there's a lot of difficult decisions. Uh, what would actually happen to the regime, for example, um, that would come? So really, you know, engaging more, taking, moving towards unification, changing the status quo. Uh, it's not something necessarily that the two Koreas maybe find appealing. Um, you know, there might be questions in terms of China, what it would think of unification or greater cooperation, Japan, the United States. Everyone is sort of, as much as we'd like the nuclear issue to disappear, to a large extent the status quo is somewhat comfortable. And then the question of can both sides live by prior agreements? And I guess I'll give just two sort of quick examples here. Um, one, you know, the North has taken and moved off its commitments to utilization a number of times. So whether it be, you know, in the agreed framework when they were taking and doing the HEU tests and had the HEU program running when we thought we had a deal for them to stop their nuclear program. Uh, Though, admittedly, it wasn't explicit that HEU was banned at the time, uh, be it, you know, the six-party talks where they broke off from verification and moving through and have tested since subsequently. Um, or if you look at this from the North Korean perspective, uh, North and South Korea, at the end of the Nomu Yun administration, held a second summit meeting. They reached a series of agreements. Lee Myung-bak came to power, did not implement those agreements. So in terms of the perspective of both sides, there has sort of been a lack of follow through on agreements that have been reached. So, you know, even if we get a deal, you know, both sides might have reasons to think that the other might not live up to it. So, since we've been talking about unification and cooperation, and since, as Terry pointed out, I do a lot of economic stuff, I thought it might be interesting to take and look at a test case and sort of see where the relationship stands and what the prospects might be. And I want to take and look primarily at the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Now, the reason being for that is that the May 24 sanctions have cut off all economic cooperation except for through Kaesong. And it actually prohibits new investments in Kaesong by South Korean companies. So essentially, everything is frozen at Kaesong. Um, so Processing Commission, which is how North and South Korea first started economically cooperating, has essentially disappeared. And Puck and Hayes administration has done some economic aid over the last year or so, but it's still fairly small. So we're largely talking about Kaesong. Um, prior to the suspension of the complex in 2013, you had 123 firms, about 53,000 workers, and about 1.9 billion in trade. Now, after the shutdown, the question was, can we internationalize this complex? And Pak and Hay basically hit it on the head, which is that if you're going to take and break, you know, regulations and promises, uh, 
and suspend KSONG, no country in the world will invest. Basic business. If I can't trust that you're not going to take and seize my assets or you know, lock me up or shut the border down or just do arbitrary things, it's not a very good business decision. So after the complex was reopened, the question of internationalization came up. Now, before it had been shut down, there had actually been one joint venture, a Japanese-South Korean venture called Taesong Hata. I've been to the plant. Um, eventually, the Japanese side of the venture sold out, uh, and it became just a Korean venture. Uh, the Japanese auto company Predal and some Chinese firms had looked in the past at going into Kaesong. And interestingly, Kimberly Clark, which is a US company, had considered at one point actually investing in Kaesong. Now, since the shutdown, we've seen the following. Former Italian Prime Minister Enrico Leta uh, had suggested that it would be a good idea for European companies to uh, invest. Uh, I just want to be clear, this wasn't the reason he ended up losing his job, uh, but not something necessarily which you're probably going to find much support of in Europe. And having talked to some Europeans, the human rights issue is actually a bigger impediment to investment there than it is than the nuclear issue would be for them. Um, you have uh, Me and Friends, which is a German apparel company that already has a partnership with one of the firms in Kaesong, who had thought about investing through the South Korean firm, so indirectly. Um, some Korean American apparel, whol apparel wholesalers had thought about investing. Um, they foolishly said that they thought they could get around uh, US sanctions, uh, which I found somewhat interesting, especially if you're saying it publicly. Probably not a good idea. Perennially, there's talk of Chinese firms. Uh, Korea has largely concluded a new free trade agreement with China. Um, Kaesong is included in that agreement. The expectation is, is that with that inclusion, Chinese firms might find the complex more appealing. Um, and lastly, there was a G20 delegation which did a tour, but nothing pretty much has come from that. The one commitment we have is Gros Beckert, which is a German uh, company. They make industrial sized needles. They are going to set up a sales office in Kaesong. Um, I think that's somewhat interesting because it gets around a lot of the sanction issues because they wouldn't actually be doing business with North Koreans, though they would be hiring two North Koreans for their shop. Uh, they would be selling to the South Korean firms in Kaesong. So it's, once again, somewhat indirect. Now, basic problems. Well, we've talked about political risk. In terms of profitability, some companies are slowly becoming profitable, but largely, even though South Korea gives significant subsidies, it's been fairly unprofitable for most of the companies. Uh, labor and wages. Uh, North Korea has contractually agreed with South Korea to a certain wage scale. North Korea consistently, and even last year, tries to unilaterally change the wages. Um, companies are not allowed to compete with each other in terms of wages. So if I have a garment factory and you have a garment factory, and you want to get my workers because they're better than yours and you're willing to pay them more, you can't do that. Um, you have to work through the North Korean government to take and have your workers assigned to your company, so there's not a free labor market. Uh, you can decline certain workers, but once again, you don't really have a choice of your workforce. Um, logistics and communications. When they reopened Kaesong, one of the big things they talked about when they set up a new committee to run the complex was we're going to take and deal with the transportation issues you have. We're going to take and set up cell phone access and internet access, which don't exist in Kaesong. And which I'd point out, if you go back to the original documents agreeing to open the complex, it says that all those things should actually be allowed in Kaesong. Um, we've yet to see that still. So the North is continuing to drag their feet on the setting up of internet and cell phone coverage, things which any modern business today needs. You have reputational and perception risks. This is my guess of why the you know, Japanese venture and uh, Taesong Hata got out. Um, it happened about the same time. There were stories in the US that they had uh, a North Korean factory. Um, this is sort of like, if you remember the Nike issue with third world labor standards and everything, it doesn't matter necessarily how good the conditions are in Kaesong. The fact that it's in North Korea will create a certain perception publicly and could hurt your business later on. It's also why I think if you look at the companies that are in Kaesong, you don't see Hyundai, Samsung, LG. You know, these are all small South Korean firms. Just real quick, another problem, no MFN, which means any country who you would ship a good to from Kaesong is going to have the highest tariff level uh, that could be applied rather than a low one. So even though you have low labor costs, it becomes less uh, economically beneficial because it costs you more in terms of tariffs. Uh, 
you have the sanction issue, um, you know, third party trade issue. And while Kaesong is in um, a series of South Korean FTAs, as you can see, and these numbers don't come out very often, um, there's been very little trade to third parties. And at the same time, um, none of that has been done under the, any of the FTAs. And the primary reason being that when a lot of the conditions were put in the FTAs, um, they don't actually cover goods that are produced in Kaesong. So why would you want to do this? Um, well, you have, from a South Korean perspective, the spillover effect, the idea being if you can take and eventually connect back into the North Korean economy, so start getting suppliers <coughs> from North Korea, if you can take and start trading from Kaesong, the Chinese have a few zones along their border as well, cross trading, you can start integrating the North Korean economy and start moving it towards economic reforms. Um, the challenge is, um, good from the South Korean, U.S., Chinese perspective, bad from the North Korean perspective. Anytime you start involving people in economic transactions, you start creating alternative power centers as somebody becomes wealthy and wealth tends to bring power with it. Now, the downside of doing business again is the more you integrate into North Korea, the more likely you're going to take and start doing business with a sanctioned entity. Um, you know, even if you look at like the post-Soviet Union, uh, a lot of the oligarchs, they, these were all sort of mid-level or upper mid-level apparatus who took over state-owned enterprises. Um, you know, at some point, if anybody can actually supply you anything in North Korea, they're most likely going to be tied to somebody who's been sanctioned at some point by the United States or the United Nations. And so that's one of the perennial risks you run in terms of trying to actually integrate into the North Korean economy. Um, so who might actually do this? Well, it's going to have to be someone who has a high tolerance for risk. Most likely, it's going to be someone who already has experience dealing with North Korea in some form or fashion. And they're most likely also going to come from what I like to refer to as non-threatening, non-ideological countries. So once again, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, you know, Mongolia has talked about trying to do different things with North Korea. You know, countries that don't necessarily have a large stake in the nuclear issue. So where are we now at Kaesong? Uh, most of the South Korean firms are back up and running. There are a couple who decided to take and sell their business. You had seven who, because of this May 24th sanctions, couldn't move forward on their construction uh, projects and have decided to take and not wait for the sanctions to be removed. So they've given up their lend lease options. Um, one of the other challenges is South Korea does provide political risk insurance for firms in Kaesong. Uh, but the way the risk insurance was set up is that once the complex opens back up, they were all required to take and then pay back those loans. Now, the challenge for businesses, especially if you're a small or a medium-sized business, is if most of your production is shut down, that means you've lost your revenue. And if you have the insurance to take and cover your revenue so that we don't go out of business in the interim, where are you going to immediately find the revenue then to pay the state back? Um, they ended up giving them um, a six-month delay to try and work through this problem. But in the long run, in terms of any kind of risk insurance, this is something they're going to have to change. It just doesn't really feasibly work in terms of an insurance form. Um, the numbers on North Korean workers, you get this a lot of different perspectives. It's probably back close to the number that was working there beforehand, but maybe my guess is it's slightly below, uh, but roughly the same number of workers. More interestingly, um, last year, um, you had $2.3 billion in trade. So that means that you had an increase. Now, a lot of the papers are touting this as, you know, more than a 50% increase from 2013. I don't think that counts. I mean, the complex was shut down half the year. The more interesting thing is if you compare it to the baseline of before the complex was shut down, it means it's up 15, well, about 17%. Um, the other challenge though, I was looking through and I had a chance to finish some of the inflation numbers. In a lot of the goods that um, are produced in Kaesong, there's been in South Korea a relatively large level of inflation. So the increase may not actually be that much. Some of this may be inflationary as well. But it is interesting that despite the fact they've been struggling to get things back up and going, that trade is roughly at least back to where it was before it shut down. So what does this mean for a unification bonanza? I think if you look at Kaesong, Kaesong is largely sort of the microcosm for what unification might look like. 
there will be some benefits. You know, North Koreans will have better jobs than they have now. They will take and live better lives than they had been living. But it will be very challenging. And some of the challenges won't necessarily be economic. Now, obviously, a lot of the sanction issues would go away. But if you look at sort of the difficulties of getting, you know, customs clearance done, getting internet, cell phone, these are some of the things that one in the short term will be a challenge because there isn't the infrastructure in the north to take and build up business quickly. But two, it sort of raises questions of, you know, on a cultural political level, how difficult will it be to take and actually integrate, you know, people in. Now, you won't necessarily have a regime in place anymore that will be trying to stop change, but you'll have a populace that won't necessarily understand how a free market economy works, how a democracy works. And so I think this sort of stop and go that you see in Kaesong is likely to be what unification is like. So there will be benefits, but there will be many challenges uh, going forward. Thank you very much. And with that, I will take questions. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a few questions. I'm, I'm actually a China specialist here. Um, but, um, uh, one, I, I um, maybe I missed it, but uh, did you talk about how um, how did Seoul or President Park? Uh, what was the process by which they you know, revisited the whole Kaesong issue? I mean, you know, was it a no-brainer? Like, let's just get this going again, or or did you talk about that a little, or was it controversial, or you know, that whole thing? Um, the other thing was, um, and by, by the way, I. I'm glad you brought up the German comparison. I think it is very interesting. I lived in Germany during the a little bit after that, and I've actually seen some Chinese analyses of you know what are the lessons for, of German unification. Uh, um, actually, oddly enough, one one of the conclusions in the Chinese perspective is that um, that that the Soviet Union could accept German unification partly because it saw Germany as an entity somewhat separated from. Uh, from the U.S. In other words, they weren't operating in complete lock. So anyway, that, that's interesting. But I, I would, uh, just a broader question here, are you um, understanding that neither Russia nor Japan will kind of step up and play a big role in this the way China is? You know, is it, can you see this as a kind of, I call it a subset of U.S.-China relations? That is, if U.S.-China relations go really well, then there might be some progress. Or alternatively, do you think that that is a kind of um, not a constructive way of looking at it? Well, first on Kaesong, um, just for time reasons, I kind of skipped over some of the process of getting the complex back up and starting. Um, essentially, what had happened was the process had become drawn out, and nobody could quite get a formula up to take and run it. And the South Koreans essentially took and while there was some debate internally in the South, um, basically told the North either reopen the complex or we're going to take and shut it down. And specifically what sort of drove that was some of the insurance issues I talked about. They were starting to run further into the insurance claims. There were questions of how long they could maintain that. And so the PAC administration made the decision that if we're going to have to pay out the claims, we might as well go ahead and just you know, end everything, pay everyone and move on, or get it reopened. And literally within about 24, 48 hours after saying that you know, we will take and pay out uh, the closure claims if the complex isn't reopened, the North you know, came to the table and they- When was that? They, it was about late July, early August. Uh, the complex opened back up in September. So it took about a month to get it all worked out. Uh, yeah. So, or 2013, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, in essence, you know, it was ultimately the North becoming convinced that the Kore South Koreans really were willing to end the whole thing. And Incredible phrase. Yeah. And I think it was. I think she would have done it. Um, I think that this was a major miscalculation on the part of either Kim Jong-un or whomever in the regime actually made the decision. Um, I don't think it's anything where she could have backed down on. And... You know, she could feasibly say that, you know, this was something that we were, or South Korea was doing, you know, in North Korea's interest. And if the North was not willing to do it, then why should the South continue to do so? Uh, 
Um, so I think you know, they picked the wrong thing to really push her on. Um, the other issue that made it difficult is that because it is really the one area where the two actually interact with each other, I sometimes kind of colloquially refer to it as it's like their embassy. Um, you know, there were a lot of concerns of, well, what would happen on the South Korean side, you know, if we no longer have Kaesong, you know, because we won't really have a connection to the North anymore because, you know, we, we don't hold regular meetings. We don't have, you know, liaison offices, um, you know, all the food aid and everything had all been stopped. So that really was sort of the last form of inter-Korean cooperation. Um, but that's sort of how that all happened. In terms of, you know, Russia and Japan and whether you should view it through a US-China subset. I think one of the things that's interesting about this and sort of I'll give a few different aspects is that one, uh, you have a situation to where if you look back at um, the German case, there was a lot of, and I'm working on something on this right now, uh, negotiation between the United States, Germany, and Russia on sort of what the post-settlement would look like. Uh, discussion on that yeah. because of Ukraine. And um, at least what I'm seeing publicly now among some Korea experts is that there's not much of a desire to have that kind of discussion with China. Um, you know, one comment uh, recently was something to the effect of the force structure of the U.S.-Korea alliance after unification is a decision for the ROK and the United States and not China. Um, I think that's somewhat hard to really sit with because one, uh, not only do you have the historical precedent, but two, it's hard to imagine that the United States and the ROK, even if they don't talk to Chinese at all, will not take China's interest in consideration because uh, to take and leave in place a structure that you think will only antagonize China is not in anyone's interest. Um, but in terms of you know, moving this now forward into, you know, what do these kind of considerations mean then for Russian and uh, Japanese? I think in some ways, the, they move independently. And China-US relations can be a factor in terms of broader cooperation. But if we look at sort of Russia, um, Putin has long been interested in the Korean Peninsula. He sees it as sort of his outlet into Asia, the one area where Russia can perhaps have influence. Um, he knows ultimately that South Korea is the real you know, economic prize for Russia, but the only way to get there is you have to have the North Koreans taking and behaving less badly. Um, so I think you're seeing a combination of things with Russia right now. One is sort of it's their way of kind of showing the U.S., well, we can still do things with other countries and you can't stop us. Um, two, it is this sort of long-term strategy of trying to build up the Russian Far East, integrate it into Asia, and have an outlet for both the oil and the other resources. And because that entails South Korea, that means he's got to improve relations with North Korea. Um, it's probably just a benefit that right now it makes our lives difficult, or an added benefit for him. Um, in terms of the Japanese-North Korea situation, I've sort of viewed this as more of a target of opportunity in that for both governments, there's not much of a downside. I mean, there's really no, I mean, there's virtually no trade anymore uh, because of the different sanctions, both for the nuclear issue and the abductees. Um, if Abe, because he's very much tied to this issue politically, uh, can get real answers from the North Koreans, it'd be a huge domestic win for him. Um, and what they'd ultimately give up in sanctions probably won't really be that much. Um, if you're the North Koreans, if you get something and if you can improve relations with the Japanese, well, then it gives you one other partner to sort of wave at the Chinese when they start acting up. Um, so I see this as sort of a you know, win-win with no real downside for either. Now, can the North Koreans come through and actually give the Japanese credible information on the abductees? I think that's going to be really difficult. Uh, my understanding is, is that um, the Japanese have asked them to delay some of the reports because they didn't feel they were good enough and they didn't want to risk the political backlash of it coming out. Um, but yeah, I think this is more of a target of opportunity. Yes. 
uh, which they are going to, which is, are they going to do unification, <laughs> promote unification, or try to keep the unity? I think when you look at the broader regional dynamic, it makes unification more difficult. Uh, I mean, we've seen the tensions between China and Japan over the last you know, year and a half or so over the Senkakus. Um, you know, China is exerting itself more. Um, while if anyone has seen any of the excerpts from President Yimou Bok's uh, most recent memoir, or his memoir, not most recent, uh, it discusses this idea that even the Chinese perhaps have said that they don't think North Korea will survive as a regime. Um, but that being said, the question is, is, is it in China's strategic interest to see unification? Um, most likely, in the near term at least, not. Um, China would probably want to have certain assurances in place beforehand. And given the current dynamics both with Japan, and I think the one thing we need to realize is that if you look at sort of the post-Cold War scenario in Germany, a lot of the lingering issues from the Second World War were finally resolved. So Germany's permanent border with um, Poland, um, you had you know, the issues of troop deployments and s troop sizes within Germany uh, taken care of. I think it's difficult right now to see a lot of the lingering issues from the Second World War, you know, be it either the territorial ones or you know, even some of the more historical legacies which the different countries are you know, more intensely debating right now being resolved in the near future. And so the question then becomes, if you can't sort of take and reach that kind of a settlement, is there an incentive for anyone to take and encourage unification to be pushed forward? Um, you, know, you can see US reasons for supporting unification. Um, but I think once you start getting into the question of, you know, is it in Japan's strategic interest to see a unified Korea? Is it in China's? Is it in Russia's? You know, it starts to become more questionable. And until that changes, I think, you know, it's more difficult. Ultimately, you know, this will be a north-south driven process. But, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, when you look at this, I think, from the perspective of the North Korean regime, the question becomes, you know, what is their interest in unification? Um, my guess is, is that there's probably not much uh, in the sense that one, you know, how would they secure their status in a new unified country? What types of transitional justice issues would they face? Um, and even if there were an agreement to take and sort of do a truth commission type thing like in South Africa and sort of just move beyond the whole issue, you're still going to see a lot of people who will move from being you know, either you know, the leader of North Korea in Kim Jong-un's case, or you know, a high-ranking general, someone of wealth and privilege, into a much less certain political and economic status. And people generally don't like to give up power. Um, so I think you know, it's difficult to see the two moving forward right now. And the regional dynamics you know, sort of help cement that in place and provide options for North Korea to take and buttress itself should it need help. Well, I want to avoid the mistake of many of uh, predicting collapse at any certain point of time. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that if and when it happens, it'll be one of those things where we'll wake up one day and, you know, we'll see on the news, you know, that Kim Jong-un has fled the country or something. And then there'll be questions of why we didn't see it coming. And the reality is, is you don't see these kinds of things coming. Uh, but could there be a coup or could... Um, there be some other type of transition to take place? You know, I think this is the question. If you look at the Arab Spring as an example, one of the things that was interesting to me that came out of that was there was a question when Egypt, when Mubarak uh, lost control of why did this happen? Because all the Middle East experts thought this is not possible. You know, there is no way you can remove Mubarak. And the one conclusion one of the scholars came to in a foreign affairs article that he wrote at the time was that all the analysts had made the mistake of assuming that the interests of Mubarak and the interests of the regime were the same. 
And in reality, they were not, and they were separable. So I think if at some point, you know, people in the military or others, you know, believe that, you know, Kim Jong-un is behaving erratic, that he is not looking after their best interests, is it possible that, you know, they could seek to remove him? I would say yes. Um, is it likely? Um, it's probably very difficult the way the security structure is set up in the regime in terms of, you know, the way people are tapped in uh, communications and things are monitored. It's hard to imagine, you know, someone planning a coup. Uh, you also run into the issue of, you know, Kim Jong-un has been fairly thorough in taking and removing people from power and fairly quickly. Only two of the people on his father's um, pallbearers, if I remember correctly, are still within power in the regime. Uh, you know, we know what happened to Zhang Zhang Tech, though I think that might in the long run be a mistake uh, in terms of, you know, the idea I'm sure was to demonstrate that you can't cross Kim Jong-un, but it could also lead eventually people to reach the conclusion that if you don't move before he does, that, you know, this is what will happen. So that could play out either way. Um, but I think the, the coup is possible but difficult. In terms of a popular rebellion, uh, if we look at the way North Korea takes and separates people, you know, you have to have a pass to leave your own town. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to travel. Um, you have a situation to where there is often family punishment. So if you take and do an act against the state, it's not just yourself that's punished. It's your entire family. And so there's a large degree of control and separation and disincentive to a popular uprising. Um, so I think a popular uprising is much more difficult than a coup would be. Once again, I would never say nothing is impossible, but I think that they're both unlikely. And I think one of the challenges that we face in sort of looking at North Korea is, and I mean, this is understandable, but we often sort of apply the constraints or the needs of, you know, the United States or China or some other country that they have domestically on North Korea. And what I mean by that is, is you know, you'll often hear people say, well, North Korea has to reform economically because the economy has collapsed. And if they don't, you know, the state will fall apart. Well, the challenge is, is that, you know, we're viewing that from the perspective of, you know, President Obama has to create jobs or else, you know, he'll face political consequences. In China, you know, they don't have a democracy, but they understand that if they don't keep creating jobs, there will be domestic upheaval and that they have to take and, you know, keep growing the economy. North Korea is different. They simply have an elite they have to take and keep satisfied. And so as long as they can extract enough revenue, be it either from legal trade through things like Kaesong, be it from illicit trade in their weapons and other programs, um, and then, you know, bring in the luxury goods they need, they can maintain control. They don't face the same pressures that we do. Yes. Yeah. I'm just going to comment from South Korea. I think the, the most important thing is denuclearization from North Korea. So it, unless it complete, uh, not only reputation, but also the improvement of the relation impossible. So I think uh, we should more more press to against North Korea to give up a nuclear program and better than concession. So uh, what, what, how do you think the, what is the more effective to give up the uh, uh, nuclear program? Uh, pressure or dialogue and concession? How do you think that? It's the classic question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think they both have difficulties. Um, you know, Kim Dae Jung took the perspective, you know, and he talked about Aesop's fable of, you know, if you take and engage, and you know, the idea being that you know, with the sun and the wind, you had this debate, and the wind blew on the man, and he pulled his coat tight, but you know, if the sun gradually warmed him up, he would get warm, and he'd take his coat off. You know, the challenge of this, though, is that in a fable, time is on your side. In a democracy, time is not. So 
if there may be a logic underpinning engagement, the challenge is, is in any democratic society or democratic polity, you need to see results in a relatively short period of time to support a policy. Now, you know, there's people such as Moon Chung-in, who uh, was involved in the Kim Dae-jung administration and who's written on this and would argue that because uh, it took the North Koreans a while to adjust this policy and then because you had President Bush who quickly changed US policy, that there was really only a six month period to where the sunshine policy was in practice and so it was never really given a fair chance to work. You know, there may be some truth to that, but it demonstrates you know, the challenges of engagement that if you don't see quantifiable, demonstrable results in a short period of time, then it's hard to continuously maintain you know, engagement going forward. And we've seen this in South Korea has, you know, there's sort of, there's less support for simply unconditional engagement. Now, you know, there's an alternative to this, which is the no mu yun idea, which is that basically you can't really engage the North, but you can, in essence, buy them off. And so as long as you take and maintain, you know, a supply of food aid and, you know, other aid to the North, that, you know, they'll cut back on their programs, they'll be, they'll feel less threatened and therefore you can take. And you know, maybe at some point reach denuclearization, but I think even the no Yun administration probably didn't really think the North was gonna denuclearize. Um, you know, the challenge with pressure is, you know, you have, we'll say, one in a tenth safety valves, which is that, you know, you have China. How much is China going to take and ultimately close the border and shut off trade to really pressure the North. Um, you know, I think things like refugees into China are legitimate issues. Probably not the real reason at the end of the day the Chinese wouldn't want to do it. Um, you have broader security you know, issues at play. Uh, but you know, Russia you know, itself you know, could try to provide a lifeline as well. That's where the you know, maybe one-tenth comes in because it wouldn't necessarily be as you know, able or willing as China. So I think it's hard to take and apply just pressure. And so, you know, what I think we've seen, and this isn't to say that there aren't other things that could have been done, but, you know, Pak and Hay has essentially tried to take and move policy towards one, something that could be consensus in South Korea. Now, I don't think we've gotten anywhere near a consensus in South Korea on policy towards North Korea, but a policy that isn't primarily one of a hardline policy and one that isn't primarily one of a soft line engagement policy. Understanding that you need both tools to take and work with North Korea. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, oh, sorry. I mean, uh, uh, it's not official. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, it just looked like you had something I to say, so yeah. The uh, yeah. Well, you see. And but the back when they said uh, we need uh, talk and we need more uh, relation improvement. So I think it, it's not I impossible. So yeah. I mean, I, I no, yeah, and I think you actually you kind of need both, but I, the challenge sort of comes down to, and you know, I mean, this is why she's worked to improve relations with China because if you're not somewhat on the same page as the Chinese, then it's difficult to take and implement a policy. And in a certain sense, South Korea and China can inhibit each other's policies, but if you really want to achieve progress, you need to try and align China's policy as well. But at the same time, you know, here's the thing. If the North Koreans engage in tests or other things that you know, we're trying to discourage them from doing, you have to take and engage what people call hardline policies, be it sanctions or sh shut off some type of trade. But that being said, if they're responding positively, you know, you do need to try and engage and talk to see where it goes. And then you do need to figure out where you can take. And one of the things that I haven't understood, there's a lot of debate on the May 24th sanctions about whether they should stay in place or they should be removed. But you don't ever hear really a lot of, well, what about partially removing them? You know, South Korea making a gesture of saying, all right, we will take and you know, allow additional South Korean investment in Kaesong, you know, might be one example. Uh, 
you know, we're not going to take and remove all the sanctions, but as a gesture to the North to bring them to the table, um, you know. So I think there's ways you can be creative with this and not necessarily move completely in one direction or the other. And I think that's important too because you need to keep the North in a perspective to where you're demonstrating to them that there are opportunities to take and have a better relationship with South Korea, with the United States, with everyone else. But at the same time, you need to also remind them that there are consequences when they take and engage in behavior that's not acceptable to the international community. But yeah. at, at the same time, I feel like with uh, South Korea pursuing a policy of reintegration and the assumption that that brings that the North, that the regime, the governing regime of North Korea no longer exists, that there is no incentive uh, for the North Korean government to, to engage in any kind of talks. Uh, if their policy was more along the lines of a normalization of relations or recognition of, uh, you know, a sovereign North Korea, yeah. then that would at least leave room for talks. But as long as the, the public policy and President Park has her, uh, you know, uh, politics that she has to mind and her, um, you know, domestic audience that she has to mind also, that really precludes that for her politically. Um, but as long as that begins with we're pursuing a policy of reintegration and the assumption that follows of, you know, North Korean government, you, you no longer exist in our policy at the end of the day, uh, then that leaves very little room for any kind of real progress to take place. Yeah. And I mean, this was, in essence, the North Korean response to the Dresden Address, which is that you're talking about absorption. You know, we don't believe in absorption. You know, we reject this policy. Um, you know. I think it's the challenge because, you know, when you talk about unification, the question then becomes, you know, how do you go about this on, we'll say, a political level? Let's set aside, because the economics, I think, has been overworn and everything. You know, if you have a unification of equals, does that mean that South Korea becomes less democratic? You know, or, you know, like, is there a way you can split the difference? Now, maybe I'm just not creative enough to come up with that way, but I think it's difficult to sort of figure out how you do that. And this is where I get in, you know, my comment earlier about, you know, if you're Kim Jong-un, you know, if you're any of the elite generals or Korea, you know, Workers' Party people, you know, what happens to you? How do you fit into this new regime? You know, um, you know, does North Korea get the foreign minister, South Korea gets the defense minister, you know, do you divide up the post? You know, I mean, that seems unlikely as well. So, you know, I think you're right, you know, on the one hand, for domestic reasons and others, you know, you need to keep the idea of unification alive. But on the other hand, how appealing is what ultimately probably does to the North, even if you're not trying to say that, look like, you know, the elimination of the North Korean state, you know, how appealing is that to them? Probably not very. So it does, yeah, make policy difficult. Or, sorry, I keep looking that way. Is there any questions on this side? My question is more typical than my junior officer. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how do you assess um, President Bakunet's address in Dresden? Because uh, actually, I I didn't notice the controversial point of the, the address, but I saw the uh, TV show yesterday too. There are so many controversial points about the, the only address, because uh, some people said her address was outstanding because her, uh, she gave some message to the, to the uh, internet to the society, such as, uh, why we have to unify to Korea. But some people argue that it was not good because uh, uh, there is no some kind of doctrine or there is, there is no impact. It was not impressive to international society. So uh, how do you think about that? Okay. So I guess just to make sure that I understand correctly, uh, your question is, wasn't it an effective speech because sort of what is the next step almost basically? I think when you look at the speech, there are parts of it that if you look at them in terms of sequencing, make sense. Uh, I am a big proponent of you know, trying to get the family reunions started back up. 
uh, basically for two reasons. One is that you know, many of these people will not be around much longer. And if they're going to have a chance to meet their relatives, it's going to have to be in the next few years. Uh, but beyond that, if setting aside the issue of whether unification is going to happen and be feasible, I think if you're going to have long-term understanding and cooperation between the two Korean states, you know, a lot of it is going to happen on an interpersonal level. And it's those families that are going to have the connections that will help build that um, you know, cooperation. Uh, people who will be able to say to you know, their you know, great uncle or something, you know, this is what we're really thinking. These are the challenges we face. Now, there's difficulty in that because of the control of information in North Korean society and the lack of desire to have you know, them really interact with the South. But I think if there was a seriousness on the North part to have a normalized relationship with the South, that a significant part of that is in the family reunions and bringing the families back together, letting them communicate, letting them talk, and letting them meet, because they are going to be the foundation of that sort of society. Um, you know, some of the other aspects, you know, the humanitarian side, you know, aid for you know, women and infants, you know, these I think are all important things. Um, you know, you, at some point you have to take and work on building the North Korean society back up, and part of that is you know, the population, you know, making sure it's healthy, trying to make sure, you know, a lot of the companies at Kaesong have talked about that, you know, the workers are intelligent, that they, you know, learn quickly and everything. And that may be true, but we're probably also seeing a lot of people who are somewhat tied into the elites as well. So, you know, there are questions as to how good the North Korean education system overall is. And so, you know, building up, you know, educational structures and everything. I think there's a lot of good things there that would benefit North Korea, even if you ended up in a confederation or if you ended up with two separate states. Um, you know, the challenge, though, is probably is that it's all wrapped up in this broader vision. And so then does that then make the North Koreans less likely to engage on these types of issues? Um, but, you know, I do think that there were actionable way forward, ways forward. The challenge is just, you know, as I sort of said early on, you know, if you don't have a willing partner, you can have the best of intentions. You can have the best of ideas, but they won't go very far. And, you know, one of the things I think that's come up in South Korea at times is, you know, if you look at, for example, polling, most people view Park and Hayes policy as a hardline policy similar to Emu and Box policy. Um, having talked to some of the people who designed the policy early on, you know, my take would be is that they were fairly genuine in their desire to reach out to North Korea. Um, just as I think, you know, the Obama administration was fairly genuine in its desire to try and reach out to North Korea when it first came into power, um, you know, when Kim Jong-un first took over. Um, but at the end of the day, be it either for its own internal domestic reasons or you know, others, you know, North Korea hasn't been at a spot to where it felt it could really do these things. Now, can North Korea ever get to that point? And maybe that's the real question you know, we should be looking at is, you know, regardless of who's in power, regardless of what the policies are, when will the North Korean state machinery be in a position to take and engage on things you know, of substance, you know, be they either economically, be they either humanitarian, you know, North Korea, other than trying to take an on the UN Human Rights Report um, to discredit it wherever possible, hasn't substantively engaged on any of the issues. You know, is there ever a time or way, you know, I don't think North Korea is going to change overnight, but to where maybe on some of the things like, you know, forced starvation and things, to where we can get them to agree, all right, you will work to make sure the populace has adequate food. You know, we're not talking about political rights or anything here, anything dangerous, simply, you know, feeding your own people, you know. And, you know, there's difficulty even getting to sort of those basic levels. And the question is, like I said, when can we get to a point to where we can work on those kinds of things? Okay, we are out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. So, Troy, thank you very much for an excellent